a very good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this 150th episode of together for education webinars brought to you by notebook almost 2 years ago in april 2020 when the pandemic had just set in and schools had closed down we at notebook felt it was our duty to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions today 150 episodes later this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated thanks to your love and support we have discussed extremely curricular topics here like digital learning nep and assessments extracurricular topics like sports theater topics even like school finance or more evolved topics like mental health engagement has been an industry buzzword for a while now across all sectors companies want their com- consumers to be engaged content creators and social media experts expect their audiences to be engaged you as educators want your students to be engaged as well at notebook it is an underlying philosophy that a combination of storytelling art and music can be used effectively to engage the learner and it is then that neurogenesis will take place however you as esteemed educators know all too well from your classroom experiences that there will be some students who are more difficult to engage than the others today we explore what strategies can be adopted to bring these students into the fold of learning as well to discuss this our first speaker today is mr philip barrett mr barrett retired as the deputy headmaster from the illustrious doon school in dehradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions mr barrett served the doon school as housemaster head of department dean of activities dean of student welfare deputy headmaster second master and acting headmaster with great distinction he also carried out a visioning exercise for the doon school in the year 2011 through an in-depth study of a number of british public schools and various schools in the us mr barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at wellington college uk in the year 2000 he is also an athlete an adventurer and a naturalist and we at notebook are privileged to have him as our senior advisor sir glad to have you back welcome back to the panel over to you thank you very much bhai i hope i am audible perfectly sir it's it's been a long time and i look forward to these webinars um um and and a very good evening to everyone at uh, notebook including you and achan and and the ladies and abhishek um a great uh, topic this evening um i was reminded of a saying that someone told me in some time ago he said you know when you compare architects doctors and and uh, teachers the difference is that architects display their failures doctors bury theirs and teachers just pass them along to the next class so you know if you look at schools uh, with their desks and rows and chairs and blackboards Uh, teachers in front talking to everyone this system suits some people it doesn't suit everyone and uh, you know there are some people who do very well in school and make a go of it in their lives while there are surprisingly some of them who do who hate school and do very badly in school but, but turn out quite well later in life just as there are people who do very well in school and make failures of their lives they they're not successful um when you look at harvard gardner and what he has taught us about multiple intelligences all of us know that we learn differently students learn differently and yet we teach all our students in very much the same way because it's the most convenient way to teach them um there is no time to finish a syllabus if we stress on different ways of teaching each student and so it's very much like that cartoon where all the animals in the forest are given the same test whether it's an elephant a tiger or a monkey the test is to climb a tree and therefore the disengaged back benchers are the people who just can't fit into this system of learning they can't climb that tree it doesn't mean that they are not good uh, students my own daughter who's 10 years old uh, who i uh, completely think that she is uh, suffering from an adhd problem um, i had to pull her out of school a little earlier this year because we were off on a winter vacation to the south of india and she of course jumped for joy i was disappointed because she would lose about a week of schooling but she told me she says 
I'm going to learn so much by my travel to the south. I'll be going to the Palani Hills. She will be living in different places. You know, she'll explore the forests over there. She was going to Kodai Canal. She went to Madurai. She is a person who just comes into her own outside the class. She is learning constantly when you're not sit sitting at the back of the class um, listening to a teacher. Um, the other day when she was talking about agriculture, I took her into the fields and she was plucking wheat and she saw the furrows and she saw the equipment and she, and she saw how seeds were dispersed in the wind. She says, that, Dad, I want to learn this way. And she's a classical backbencher. Now, there are two types of students who switch off in a school. One are those who find learning irrelevant, absolutely irrelevant, you know, irrelevant and boring. And they know that they are not, uh, they're, they're, the topics they love are not being covered. These compromise those talented and differently thinking kids who are creative and learn in a different way. They're not challenged enough. And then, of course, there are the academically weak students who find it difficult to keep up with the class, to catch up. They're always playing catch up. And therefore, they naturally, because they're so traumatized uh, and they, they're, being, they're being attacked from their parents, by their parents, by their teachers, by the whole school system, that they naturally switch off and they hate the experience. Now, the former type, the, the, the talented people who switch off, uh, I have so many examples in my last school. We had a boy who was absolutely zero in academics. He was a classic backbencher. But he became one of India's finest river rafters, one of the first people on the river. And he's made a great name for himself. I had another student who couldn't even switch on a computer, always in trouble. He became number two in World Tel, you know, the company that created Sanchit Tendulkar. World Tel, Romulus Whittaker the great snake man of India, who's made a name with his crocodile farm in Chennai, ran, out, ran away from school and he went to the American International School, Kodai Canal. Once the chapter on snakes and reptiles was over, he, didn't, he was not interested in anything else. And so he made a living and he made a life just because he loved one thing and there was so much that the teachers were teaching him that was not interesting. And we know people like Michael Phelps and there's so many people who were just under challenged in school, but, and they were punished. They were dropouts, you know, and you can have the Diro Bayambanis, the Winston Churchills, the Richard Bransons, the Steve Jobs, all these drop dropouts from school failed the school system, but they made something of their lives. In the second cl class, the, the second case of people, the students who are not academically, um, you know, endowed, um, they're over-challenged. They're stressed out by ambitious, over-ambitious parents and unreasonable expectations. Parents are comparing them to their siblings, uh, themselves who are gold medalists and engineers. And uh, they, of course, can be turned around if they went to a different school or went to a different curriculum. There are so many progressive schools where these students would thrive. But in the schools they are, they don't do well because they want to learn differently. Now, an effective teacher in an effective school and a different syllabus, and these children would have a huge turnaround and be different. Um, if we believe that schools as we know them are not for everyone, then we must also accept that academic success is not, is not the only yardstick for success. There are world-class chefs and world-class designers, architects, naturalists, spiritual guides, fitness gurus, politicians, businessmen, wise men, who've been backbenchers, who have suffered the agony of schooling before doing what they loved and have succeeded. I've personally taught so many leading current politicians, people who are in politics today, who would have fallen into the backbencher category, but I won't take their names because both Notebook and I will get into serious trouble. <laughs> the movie, The Three Idiots, Brings, up, brings out the shortcomings of the current education system as we know it. And uh, it goes on to show how those who are removed from the system can also contribute and have a bright future. You know, Sonam Wangcho, the character, you know, that, that uh, you know, the, the character of Rancho was based on, he's doing his own path, forging his own path in the wilds of Ladakh, as we all know. 
And maybe he was not the top of his class and he did not impress his teachers. But these are the people who are not going to learn in the way schools teach them. They are not going to learn by rote and regurgitate this learning at the end of the year is in the exams. And we teachers, we tend to give the backbenchers labels. We are quick to label them as ADHD, dyslexic, autistic, bipolar, uh, hyperactive, aggressive, passive, violent. And once we put these kids into boxes, they are given sometimes administered prescription drugs. There are huge numbers of children abroad who are on drugs, who are on medication, because teachers and educators have labeled them, they've been diagnosed. And we all have our notions of normalcy. We say that these kids do not fit into the system. They have failed the system. But I say that the system may have failed them. They, the system has failed them. And <clears throat> we fail to see the trauma that we as teachers and educationists cause and lead to by making kids conform. We all want the front benches, but we neglect the back benches because they're different. And because they don't fit into the normal bell-shaped curve, they, they fit onto the edges. And I, I would still say the system has failed them. Um, <clears throat> and that another very nice saying that I sometimes hear, uh, a child looks up and says, if I can't learn the way you teach, can you please teach me the way I learn? Also, backbenchers, you know, without knowing it, have much more fun than most people. They may be resourceful enough to get others to do their homework. They read magazines while the teacher goes on and on in the class. They read comics while the rest are working. They sometimes have the pick of the girls and the girls have the pick of the boys because they have charm. They, are, they take risky behavior. They are involved in risky behavior. They take chances. They're often multitaskers. And they're good at social media and the internet stuff. Many backbenchers are emotionally mature and have learned to take criticism and reprimands because that's what's happening all their lives. They've been got at. And very often, I think that <clears throat> they're they very optimistic because they tend to get past exams with, by doing the least amount of work. And many backbenchers have that, the talent of, you know, they're, they're glib speakers. They've got the gift of the gap. And because of this, uh, this fearlessness and this risk taking and the charm, many, many of these backbenchers do very well at interviews. And this is what maybe many employers want. I personally knew a student who went to Delhi University who took about six to seven years to pass his BA, the normal BA, not, in, not even the honors course. He captained the college team in football, was the most popular person on campus. Everybody knew him. He knew the ins and outs of the attendance system. He was very close to all the lecturers. He was very approachable and was specially approached by the students who failed to get their end of the term attendance. And he would fix it and give them all, you know, get them all 60% because he knew everyone. He went from job to job. He slept in different people's homes with his little rucksack. He never had a job. And suddenly, a couple of years ago, he emerged in Spain. And he sent me photographs of himself sitting and having lunch with Zinedine Zidane and some of the other top French and Spanish players. He was there doing something in soccer, uh, talking to the, you know, the, the cream of uh, the, 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 the Spanish you know, football. And so therefore, I think we shouldn't rule out or, uh, or, or have negative thoughts about backbenchers. And um, as I go about my work with schools in Dehradun, I have, come to, I have come to see that much of the current system, which is driven by marks and cutoffs and competitions, is not necessarily the way forward. It is the most convenient and the most effective way in educating the masses, but it's not always the best for all. We need different types of schools to cater to different types of students, the less competitive, the soft-hearted, the timid, the creative, the dreamers, the ADHD types the dysgraphics, the, dis, you know, the autistic. And new wave schools are gaining popularity. And while college entrance drives the old system of marks and grades, new employers may be looking for the talented backbenchers. And I want to end by saying that if I had my 
life all over again and I had to go through school all over again, I would like to be a backbencher because I, as I said earlier, I think backbenchers have a lot more fun um, and uh, I would have enjoyed myself and school better. Um, thank you so much for listening. I hope that sets the ball rolling uh, in this new year. Um, back to you, uh, Shabayu. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. As we have learned for 150 episodes now, you are the best opening batsman that this team could ask for. And so I can definitely personally attest to the fact that yes, backbenchers do have a lot more fun. I personally had quite a bit of that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after Mr. Barrett, it is now turn for our next speaker, Ochin Bhattacharya. Ochin is the founder and CEO at Notebook. A chartered accountant by training, Ochin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Ochin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, and a member of CPA Australia and CPA Ireland. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award. Ochin is an avid reader and a passionate traveler with keen interests in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the most renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Ochin, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Should I am audible? Loud and clear. I once again welcome all of you to today's session. Let me start with the story. The father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, was getting on a train. One of his sandals slipped off and fell to the ground. The train was moving and there was no time to go back. Without hesitation, Gandhiji took off his second sandal and threw it towards the first. Asked by his colleagues why he did that, he said one sandal wouldn't do him any good, but two would certainly help someone else. Very recently, I was uh, going through a book, a very interesting one, written by uh, uh, David Perkins. David is a founding member of uh, Project Zero at Harvard Graduate School of Education. One of the stalwarts when it comes to you know, education as a subject. And in his book called uh, Future Wise, David has referred to this uh, particular incident. And very interestingly, also, he also opined that people cherish the story as a marvelous example of a charitable act. And so it is, you know, seizing a singular moment. But as he also points out, it was more than that, much more than that. It is also a knowledgeable act. By throwing out the sandal, Gandhiji had two very important insights. First, he knew what people in the world needed. And second, he knew what to let go of. Now, why I'm referring to this uh, particular incident now, today, when we are discussing this topic about disengaged children, and the answer lies in my next deliberation. Wherein David also said, and he said that educators need to embrace the same insights. They need to start asking themselves what he considers to be one of the most important questions in education. What's, what actually is worth learning in school? It's a question that students have been asking teachers for years now, for generations together. Of course, in a slightly different form. For starters, most education 
the moment we 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 discuss about k12 education instantly what comes to our mind is a very large body of information the question is how much of it is life worthy how much of it is likely to matter in any meaningful way in the lives that learners are expected to actually live it's nice to know things we all like to know things but there are issues of balance particularly in today's digital age when no one is going to be gainfully employed for merely memorizing facts or figures which are anyways available in your fingertips the information in textbook is not necessarily what you need or would like to have and not necessarily those are skills that you need to carry in your backpack when you when you go on your trek for life instead even the most people would say that education should prepare you for life david feels and this is about his his take on it from a more global perspective from after seeing schools around the world the entire schooling system around the world globally that much of it what is being offered in school doesn't actually work in that particular direction because many a times systems are geared up in such a way that it's about building up students reservoir of knowledge of course knowledge is important at times we have all seen that in our career that yes Uh, when we discuss a particular topic we do join the dots and uh, it it helps us to get a complete picture undoubtedly but in that book you know and i was going through it a very he has laid a lot of emphasis on the fact that conventional curriculum is chained to the bicycle rack it sits solidly in the minds of parents i learned i learned that why are my children learning it and that's a natural reaction the enormous investment in in textbook cost of revising them gives familiar elements in a curriculum in a longer life span then what it might actually and justifiably deserve curriculum suffers from something of a of a of a crowded garage effect it generally seems safer and easier to keep the old bicycle around then to throw it out simply having a vast reservoir of knowledge isn't helpful if it's not being used because you would all agree that knowledge is for going somewhere right it's for for, for using it but too often we tend to focus on short term success scoring well on a quiz doing great in a spelling test unfortunately all of the knowledge accumulated knowledge that we always thought was was great but unless and until being used at some point of time we we are not able to hold on to it knowledge unused is very often forgotten no so in this particular book which is revolution in itself because the entire concept of project zero that harvard is working on I was going to some other papers as well, which are available in public domain. It's complete fresh blue sky thinking, wherein they are they are they are uh, challenging every conventional norm, making a lot of surveys on the ground, coming up with groundbreaking observations, discussing with educators all around the globe. And one of the one of the uh, results of that is uh, this particular observation about conventional curriculum. And in one very interesting session, I saw. that uh, was was conducted at harvard perkins asked the audience to think about something that they had actually learned during the first few years first you not know, 12 years 15 years of schooling that really mattered in their lives today uh, like of course beyond basics like learning to read or or, or write that of course matters but beyond that anything that actually matters to them today and the audience really struggled to give an answer and here where we are discussing about audience we are discussing about uh, research scholars at at harvard or other fellow professors and they struggled to answer and the book also gives an example say for example take a uh, take a uh, 
uh, mitosis, the process of cell division. Now, uh, during a session, he, he asked everyone in the audience, you know, hundreds of people to raise their hand if they had studied this particular topic in high school. Uh, pretty much uh, everyone raised their hand. He then asked that how many people remember what it is, basic idea. 50% hands went down. And then he asked, how many, of you, how many of you have actually used it in last 10 years? Only one hand went up. Now, he acknowledged that it's, it's, it's a very important topic. He himself is one of his favorite topics and that's the reason he, he put this question. But the fact of the matter is that as far as generalized education is concerned, very often there are information, there are, there are, there are areas which students don't actually apply. Now, also research proves that generally first graders, when, when initially they go to school, they're very interested in school. They're, they're excited, you know, new friends, first time stepping out of home, of course, it starts from kindergarten now, but they're in general, they're excited that that feeling, that, that feeling of, you know, going to a new place, making friends, being able to play, carrying their own lovely tiffin boxes, water bottles, back. It's so, it's so exciting. But over time, engagement slides and slides. There are often multiple reasons. And of course, there are, there are a host of factors. It is very unfair to blame it on one factor. And I completely agree. But one is that they don't, they, don't, they don't see the relevance of what they're learning. And very often they don't see how it serves their life. Now coming back to from where I started, as the train started up and Gandhiji tossed down his second sandal, he showed wisdom about what to keep and what to let go of. And Perkins concluded this, this whole chapter with, with a great observation where he says that those are both central questions for education. As we choose, as we choose for today's learners, the sandals they need for tomorrow's journey. I was reading about a very, very interesting project uh, and I found this very exciting. I would request uh, all of you to, to check this up. I found this very inspiring. And I'm sure many esteemed educators in this forum will be aware about this. I was reading about a project called uh, the Inspire Project. Using arts to reach out to disengaged students. And this entire project was uh, conceptualized by a drama teacher called uh, Josie Matlin in West Sussex. And then there are a host of articles on this and in many parts, of, many different parts of uh, Europe and then eventually different parts of the globe, this has been imbibed. And, and, and she was working on uh, an intervention strategy through photography, art, music, because disengagement has, has many different causes. It can, be, it can be peer pressure, it can be past experience of school. But I was referring to some wonderful examples some great areas from decades of his experience. You know, nobody could explain it better than him. And I'm sure we have, an, we have a very esteemed and experienced panel here today, and they'll also discuss about, uh, you know, their, their own take on this. But taking an outside in view, and from a more holistic perspective, we'd all agree that different factors contribute to it. You know, also circumstances at home, very important. Lack of confidence. And then again, as Sir rightly mentioned, that the whole system is failing and, and it's very unfair to blame the child if he or she is not doing well. Also, at times, uh, sibling experience of school, to, to name a few. Plus, disengagement presents itself in, in a very equally diverse range of behaviors and in a range of abilities as well. A student who, for instance, is uh, boisterous or attention seeking, for example, is no less engaged than a student who quietly, quietly removes him or herself 
from the lesson, shrinking into the background and becoming invisible. But there is one thing all disengaged students have in common. All disengagement students, whatever be the reason, whatever be the factor that led them to be, to be, to be disengaged with their peers, there is one thing that they all have common. That is, they need teachers to ensure they don't slip away from learning. And that's the very important role that educators play. And only they can do this. No one else. No technology, no digital innovation, no tech brands. I think this is something that only teachers can do. The kind of encouragement, the kind of you know, uh, motivation, which is so important for a student. Now, uh, Josie set about utilizing all information gathered in the research about, about disengaged students and started working on a model wherein uh, delivering art, photography, drama, and music, and, and conducting various workshops that were tailored to the needs of specific groups of students who were identified and identified by teachers, by support staff, and initially delivered to ninth graders. Later on, the project was extended to include other classes as well. Each unit gives students new and creative skills. So the students are interested, genuinely interested that their boredom goes away. So be it lyric writing, graffiti, stencil making, photo editing, alongside developing, you know, personal qualities such as building trust, social relationships, organizing and self-motivation, students naturally start to express themselves via the art mediums and consider their presentation of self to others. Now, their ambitions and their fears, they're asked to dress, you know, the, the way they feel comfortable and also at times, their parents are also invited to these sessions. Teachers also come in to encourage them, to motivate them, other teachers, different subject teachers. So they all get confidence that, okay, he or she is really good in something. These events are so transformative and eye-opening. And, and also, over a period of time, gradually, their, their, improved, their behavior was tracked. Attendance data were seen, achievement data were seen, and the results were so, so inspiring. For example, in first semester, 50% of students had an attendance below 85% because here we are discussing about a group of disengaged students who are almost on the verge of dropping off from school, maybe. So 50% of them had attendance below 85%. At the end of the course, 80% of students had an attendance above 90%. So that's a huge, remarkable improvement. They had something to look forward to in the morning when they were coming to school. They're excited. They're genuinely excited about it. And by the end of the session, seven out of eight students had significantly decreased, significantly decreased their behavioral points. Significant improvement. Now, many of these outcomes are not measurable. So everything at life, as we rightly mentioned, that it's not possible to come out with, uh, uh, you know, come out with numbers for everything. But their better attitude, the fact that they were more confident, the fact that they were more excited about school, that whole thing was so infectious. It was so visible, so apparent. Now, this particular project called Inspire continues to develop in response to interests and abilities of students. And now it is being implemented in other schools, other areas as well. No, uh, I think I found this really inspiring as to how art can actually be used and the wonderful benefits. I think the other aspect is when we discuss about disengaged students, and of course, this is a vast topic, you know, I'm only discussing a part, part of it, you know, or I'll say maybe 5%, 10% uh, of it, and it's, it's a huge topic. The other aspect is, as we mentioned, the role that parents have. At times, there are challenges at home, and parents have a huge role to ensure. But then again, 
since here we are discussing in the forum of educators what role does teachers or maybe counselors support staff what role do they have in school in order to ensure that the school or or, or the teachers are able to build bridges with disengaged parents because undoubtedly parents have a huge role to play i'm not discussing about what happened in last one and a half two years now of course things are much more different parents spending so much of time with students and naturally you know at times stepping into shoes of educators etc their role has only become more and more important but i'm saying either even even otherwise a very important role so i think being able to build those bridges ensure that because it has a huge impact on a child's achievement but of course doing so requires uh, sensitivity persistence giving time and simple things like for instance being able to develop that trust and confidence meeting and greeting in the morning when they are coming to drop their children to school home visits and here we are discussing about disengaged students ensuring that you know at times while giving a critical feedback they are not taken as a threat because at the, at the end of the day intention is all good because undoubtedly if if you look look at the whole thing i think the most important thing is disengagement the way i look at it is both a process and an outcome much of the academic research about students engagement and disengagement if we read, read about it we only discuss about the outcome the fact that a student is is disengaged but that's only the end point what about the steps prior to it what about the process because uh, today for instance early school leaving for example dropping off from school as i as i'm telling you is the end point of a long process so i was reading out a model called a uh, uh, participation identification model which was developed in 1989 so a student who participates in the whole learning journey is active participates ultimately does well for himself herself and the school also you know becomes more and more successful and the student identify his or her own person or with the school and that leads to completion of of learning objectives goal etc on the other hand non participation disengagement will lead to individually poor performance ultimately lead to aggregate poor performance of the school and eventually emotional withdrawal of the student which will lead to school dropout now while these processes are presented as linear processes the relationships are more accurately described as reciprocal cyclical and reinforced over time that is as students withdraw emotionally from school emotional disengagement their participation naturally declines which is behavioral disengagement leading to poorer academic performance the cycle continues over in the student's career culminating in such such a uh, dissatisfaction with school that a young person may leave school entirely so i think and that is reason it's very important to focus on the process as a whole and not only on the outcome and of course long term implications may be even more severe than that but of course was referring to the brighter side that we have all seen that yes there are achievers in many areas of life whom we have seen academically they may not be that engaged but later point of time they have done wonderful for them themselves we have seen we have seen great you know very successful entrepreneurs or people politicians people in different walks of life who have done very well for themselves but academically maybe at some point of time they are not so engaged but that's only the brighter side of life at times what may also happen and that does happen especially in a in in a country like ours where the pyramid is so steep and the competition is so severe that ultimately that leads to not getting admission in, in in an institution of choice becoming or staying unemployed or underemployed lower average income levels social exclusion i think the worst possible thing not being able to confidently 
you know, be a part of the group. And in, in, in today's work culture, whichever organization a student in future works for, he or she, is very important to be comfortable in a collective setup. But then that social exclusion, not being, not, not, not having the confidence to be a part of the group, to contribute. And also, of course, serious health aspects because risky health behaviors that may come in from depression, lack of physical activity. And eventually the worst thing, of course, being engaged, being maybe engaged in crime or drag, drugs, etc. So hence, we would all agree that the, that, the, that the particular issue is very serious. And I think uh, as we discussed that there are a host of factors which lead to this. So naturally, the way I look at it, the solution also needs collective effort in letter and spirit from, from all stakeholders of the educational ecosystem, not only educators. I think parents also have a huge role to play. The society at large has a huge role to play. You know, to ensure that, that we make them feel, make them feel, you know, wanted, make them feel loved and make them feel, yes, of course you can do. Maybe there are other areas which are of more relevance to you, where you may do better. So I think these are a few things that uh, I wanted to discuss. I thank all of you for giving me a patient hearing. We have a wonderful panel here today, a very experienced panel of educators, and I'm sure they will enlighten us with their views on this very important topic. Over to you, Shubhayu. Thank you, Ochin. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as Ochin mentioned, we do have a fantastic panel lined up for you. But before we go on to the panel, I wanted to speak to you a little bit about Notebook. Today, when we're talking about engagement as a concept, Notebook was built around that entire concept of engagement. The idea was to use content in a way, a very effective way, that engages students with the process of learning. Once a student is engaged enough, finds enough interest, enough curiosity, after that, the deliberations that you as teachers have during their classroom sessions or the discussions they have with you outside the classrooms have a lot more effect. Notebook makes short videos pertaining to the school curriculum. If you head over to our website or our mobile apps, you would find more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal. These videos come in handy in two places. One, when the teacher is taking a class, they can use these videos as a short visual introduction to the topic that is being taught. This can take up about six to seven minutes of a class and the students can watch a short video before they start discussing the topic with you. Next, when the students are learning at home by themselves, they have access to these same videos on their personal devices, laptops, computers, mobile phones, whatever they have access to, they can watch notebook videos on those and revise the topics and get reminded of things that you taught in class the day the video was played. I'm now going to play a short mashup of a few of the notebook videos so that you have a better idea of what it is that I'm going on and on about. Namaste, Bachchon. Notebook mein aapka swagat hai. Is nai video ko aapke saamne prasthut karte huye hume behat khushi ho rahi hai. Hamara uddeesh hai paramparaga siksha ko adhunik tarike se pesh karna. ताकि हमारी ये नई पीढ़ी या आप सभी कहीं भी कभी भी इसे आसानी से पढ़ सकें। Let us find out about this system. Firstly, the Mughals did not believe in the rule of primogeniture. Primogeniture is a system of tradition where the eldest son inherits the father's estate or property. The Mughals followed coparcenary inheritance, in which the father divides his property among all his sons. The income of the Mughal emperor came from the produce of the peasants. The kings collected the taxes from the peasants through the zamindars. The zamindars could be village headmen or powerful chieftains. For example, in the expression 6x cubed minus 9xy, the terms are 6x cubed and minus 9xy. 
Each term is made up of factors. For example, in our previous example, 6, x, x and x are factors of 6x cubed and minus 9, x and y are factors of minus 9xy. कर्म के आधार पर क्रियाओं को दो भागों में बांटा गया है अकर्मक क्रिया और सकर्मक क्रिया अकर्मक क्रिया जिन वाक्यों में कर्ता के साथ कर्म का प्रयोग ना हो उन वाक्यों की क्रियाएं अकर्मक क्रिया के अंतर्गत आती हैं, जैसे मोहन रोता है श्याम दौड़ता है Just as humans need fire, water, oil, vegetables, etc., as some of the essential ingredients to cook food, plants also have a few basic necessities to self-prepare their own food as a part of autotrophic nutrition. These basic ingredients are water, sunlight, soil, and nutrients. Let us now go through an example. We begin with the date, 30th October, 2019. Then the heading, a visit to an orphanage. followed by the salutation dear diary next we come to the body or the content notebook mein aap sabhi ka punah swagat hai well ladies and gentlemen that was a mash up of short snippets of some class 7 videos if you head over to our website www.notebook.school or our mobile apps for android and ios as i said you would find more than 10000 such videos at your disposal It is now my privilege to present before you the wonderful panel that we have with us today. We are privileged to have with us Dr. Rita Chatterjee, who holds an MA, an MEd, and a PhD in English. She is an academic with a huge body of experience, plethora of exposure, and an abundance of virgin ideas in the field of learning and exchange of knowledge. She has always believed in the integral approach of learning system, generating wisdom more than mere success. Success to her is a temporary high accomplished by an individual. which no doubt significant and valuable but wisdom is a foundational brick that says life long according to dr chatterjee education has two prime objectives one is to earn a living and the other is to earn a life she believes that to live is not to experience life life to her is a broader and more colorful spectrum than living her efforts are to provide the best ambience and opportunity to all her seekers of knowledge so that they can learn the art of searching and inquiry that leads to the final goal of accomplishing wisdom true knowledge or the comprehension of the self ma'am thank you so much for sparing the time to be here today privileged to have you on the panel we also have with us mrs malabika sen who is the headmistress of the krishna public school in raipur she holds an ma in english and a ba and has had 24 years in the field of education she herself completed her schooling from kamal kovin school in rorkela orissa and then graduated from dav college rorkela She went on to do her B.A. from Kolkata and postgraduate degrees from IGNO. She started her career as a teacher in Kolkata, where she worked for five years, and then moved to Raipur, where she continued her work in education. She is passionate about the upliftment of all skills amongst the students and dreams of building a nation bestowed with good human beings, self-built and innovative personalities who can add redescent feathers to our motherland. Ma'am, thank you so much for being here today. It's a privilege to have you on the platform. We also have with us Mr. Shubhrata Mitra, who is a principal and educationist from Siliguri, West Bengal, currently working in Bihar. He has 15 years of experience in the field of education and working for the betterment of society. He is an educationist who is working for the betterment of academics and socio-economical conditions of those children who are specially from backward classes. Since his childhood, it was his dream to dedicate himself in the field of education. as well as to do some betterment of those children who need it the most it gives him immense pleasure and a sense of satisfaction to work with children and their enlightened faces give him an unparalleled feeling of fulfillment he has a dynamic personality and his favorite gift is the everlasting happiness of the children he is a strong believer in optimism and likes to face challenges in life he dedicates most of his time for the betterment of children by teaching them values and morality His guidelines help the students to improve their academics, character, and to have more strong personalities. In his pastime, Mr. Mitra loves teaching those children who are not getting the opportunity but deserve it. 
He started his career in a school as a teacher come academic coordinator and has grown to positions of exam controller, vice principal and administrator in a prestigious school with his ardent interest, progressive and vast knowledge. His experience and influence impacted many children. Now, he is serving as the principal in a prestigious institution besides being a budding writer. Sir, thank you so much for sparing the time to be here with us today. Privileged to have you on the platform. I shall start my video now and stop my share would request the panelists to please also switch on their videos. Mr. Mitro, Dr. Chatterjee, uh, Malavika ma'am, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Mrs. Sen, if you could please switch on your video. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Chatterjee, your video, I think, went off, please. Well, very good evening. And once again, thank you so much for sparing the time to be here with us today. Uh, Shubhayu, it says that you have switched off the my video. Check, it, please. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. I'll switch yeah. back on. So sorry. So yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Once again, a very good evening and thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Uh, Rita, my first question is to you. Uh, we, talk, we are talking about the disengaged, disengaged students here, the backbenchers as we often call them. Now, they are also part of that cycle that if they are not getting good grades, they get demotivated, getting worse grades. How do you stop that cycle from setting in? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, clearly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am speaking from an experience gathered over, say, last 42 years, okay? So what I will be telling you is exactly what we have experienced in the field when you are working with the total stakeholders involved in school education, which is, of course, our dear parents, our teachers and our students. My opinion is that there are never disengaged children, but there are disengaged teachers with due apologies and disengaged parents. Now, as the first speaker or the second speaker said that it's a process. So how does that happen? How does a teacher become disengaged? Because when we move into the career of wanting to be a teacher, we are all very enthusiastic. We all go through our interviews saying that we want to do this, we will do the other. But once they come into the system, the disengagement sets in. Now we have to think in our positions as to how to help the teacher to evolve. And therefore today, in most schools across most academic boards, the teacher training is vitally, vitally important and is to be taken very, very seriously by the school management. Now there are a plethora of teacher training that is happening and most of these teacher training modules talk about social emotional learning. What is happening in an offline classroom as also in the online classroom, which is that we tend, like the speakers have already elaborated, we tend to make our work easy. And to make our work easy, we primarily focus upon those children who are able to understand our deliberations. Instead, as teachers, once we are working with the children. We also know the ones who may not be understanding. And therefore, we have to make our lesson plans in such a manner, almost the IEP variety, individual lesson plans, wherein we are able to, through our lesson plan, without making it obvious, talk to every individual child, be it online or offline. 
Now, there are various methods that can be adopted to do that. And the best place to see whether a child is happy in the classroom or no is not the classroom, as Mr. Bharat said, but outside the classroom. So the best place to see whether the child is learning or whether the child is engaged in the growth of himself in his school environment or the growth of himself in his social environment is places like the canteen, is places like the football field, you know, the, the uh, swimming pool, the area outside the swimming pool, the changing area. That is where you see how you have groomed your children. And that is where a teacher's success comes in. Now, when you talk about parents, see, most, I, I, you know, I also want to tell you that in my experience as a teacher, I have traveled across a variety of kinds of school. The government schools, the government aided schools, the so-called good schools, the not so good schools, the well-off schools, the not so well-off schools, you know, and, and these days, there's been a language going around where you call the students your customers. No, no, it's wrong, absolutely wrong, okay? But that's happening. We do say that. We do say clients to our parents, incorrect. The moment we start saying that, we think like business houses and we lose our focus that the child is my prime focus. We lose that focus. I'm not saying that budget is not important. Of course, budget is important. But is it more important than the growth of that individual child? And that is where the management plays a role. And that is where, you know, in CBAC these days, you have training for management people as well. Because the thought process has to undergo a change. Yes, I have come into school education. Does it mean that I am? into business? Am I making money or am I earning money? And that is what we have to focus upon. So therefore, just a minute. Yeah, so therefore, as I was telling you that we have noticed that in schools where the pay scale is comfortable, the teacher training is way more effective. The control is good. And therefore, the children should grow. The training can happen. I don't want to mention, but there are excellent government schools where teacher training is taken up so seriously and the children are doing very, very well and they do well finally as you said, in the dignity of life. It's very important we give our children the kind of education where they can live their life with dignity. And they do well because teachers are conscious of their, of their role as a teacher. Now for parents, what happens is that parents, they put in their children into schools. There are schools and schools and schools. And I think that you know, we need to do our homework on these schools as parents. We don't do that. We don't do it. You know, we go by the name, we go by the board, we go by the flash, and we put the children in those schools. Then when my child is not doing well, when my child is not being attended to, my child is not being well, not doing well because my child has not been attended to, then I get angry with my child without doing my homework. When I go to buy merchandise, I do my homework. But when I go to put my child in school, I'm not doing my homework. I'm going by the, by the brand, by the look, by the style. And that is where the difficulty is set in. So I feel that there are disengaged teachers, there are disengaged parents, they're never disengaged children. And you know, teach me like I will learn, I will be a learner. And therefore nowadays, you have a lot of stress on experiential learning. Uh, we, uh, for example, there was a school I visited where the teachers were training the children a project on mask, M-A-S-K, what is happening now. And they did it by using the cross-curriculum approach. So there were 
the history teacher talking about masks that used to be in your and how masks developed. So they spoke about literature as well. The geography people spoke about the kind of masks available across. So we discussed Manipur, Mizoram, etc. The mask styling. We spoke about the, the material, the merchandise, the cotton that is used. The uh, children were told to speak to their parents and parents to the doctors during this last two years. So, you know, it, it evolved into a fantastic exhibition where every child had something to say. Every parent had an opinion which was used. So we evolve. And I'm sure, yeah, we'll all do well together with the people like Notebook encouraging academics. Yes, we'll do well. Thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was uh, such a positive take on the whole uh, situation. And I, I love the cross uh, cross cross disciplinary approach to you know using masks as an example. Beautiful, uh, Mrs. Sen. If I may come to you next, ma'am. Uh, as Dr. Chatterjee said, the teacher might be the point of disengagement as well, not at the student's end. But the disillusionment must be setting in for a reason. You're teaching a large class. Naturally, the better students, the more academically brighter students are your path of least resistance. It's easier to teach them, get them to good grades. And the students in the back trying to get through to them is also going to take away from teaching the others in the class who have already perhaps grasped a topic. How do you balance between these two, ma'am? Mrs. Sen, are you there? Mrs. Sen, ma'am, are you there? Uh, Gagori, if possible, please, uh, could you please call up ma'am and check if she's available? Yes, yes I'm doing. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chari, if I may come back to you. Uh, you spoke about parents being disengaged. Now, until a few years back, ma'am, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, clearly. Uh, so until a few years back, we have seen a situation where a child coming home with a report card with not so glorious grades would catch the ire and the wrath of the parents. And which we today very clearly identify as counterproductive. So the people who are listening in, a lot of them are also parents. What advice would you give them if they have to figure out if their child is disengaged and if they do find out, what are the steps to take? Okay. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for that question. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, just a minute. Sure. Yeah. Can you? Can you see me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, that's a very, very important question and perhaps the most vital one uh, in the academic circle. The first thing that a parent needs to do is think a little bit on his or her style of involvement. If the child has not done well, comes back with a report card that uh, the parent is not very happy to see, the parent should first think on his or her style of involvement. Certainly, all parents are involved, yes, because uh, parents, uh, you know, all of us, we have our lives to live and we have our jobs to maintain and mummies and daddies get back late at night and etc, etc. So that's also an involvement. But if you say that, oh, I am doing so much for you and yet you cannot bring me back a good report card, it's a most unhealthy uh, thing to think apart, leave alone saying it. So I think that the parent must find out that where must one start? And there is nothing yeah, wrong start. in, <laughs> sorry, yeah, and there's nothing wrong in understanding that the process can start at the beginning. The process of understanding where my child needs to attend more depends largely on the parent knowing what the child has missed out on and why. So I think Malubika is back. Uh, I'll just complete what I was saying. So therefore, an interaction with the school is vital. The school must cooperate to ensure that the child 
difficulties are explained to the parents correctly. And there needs to be this coordination between the school teacher, the parent, and the parent is able to understand, and then go ahead helping out the child. But of course, no miracles can happen overnight. It will take its time and patience is very important on part of the parents. Yeah, I think I've finished and Maribika and uh, Subayu, yes. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Sen, I'm glad to have you back. I'm so sorry, uh, some technical no. issues were there. No worries, ma'am. We are all too familiar with them over the last two yeah, years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, thank you, so thank you. Ma'am, I was asking you that as a, yeah. as a teacher, the better, the more brighter, the higher scoring students in class are your path of least resistance, right? Getting them to get good marks is perhaps the most effective use of the teacher's time. Now you have the backbenchers, the more disengaged ones who are not as interested and trying to get through to them again and again is also going to take away from the time you get to teach the other students in class. How does a teacher balance these two? Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, you're talking to a person who has never thought about marks oriented students. Uh, that's the last thing I would think. Because for me, uh, as long as I used to teach, nowadays I don't teach. I'm only in the administration part. So when I used to teach, I always chose a class which was, I should not use the word weaker, but yes, uh, where the students need more care, uh, more alertness, more togetherness, and more encouragement, I would say. So I've always chosen that, that, that kind of students. And uh, believe it or not, that was the, when they pass out uh, their schooling in class 12, uh, that was the only reward when they come to me and uh, proudly and confidently talk to me. That was a reward for me. That yes, that in this field I have excelled that uh, from uh, gra grassroots level, like where they were in backbenches, I would not say backbenches, but uh, people, students who don't want to, are not interested in the uh, regular studies, they must be talented in other, some other field for sure. So these people, they come to me and they talk to me confidently. And uh, after five to six years, they come to me and they say, say that I have settled in this field, I've settled in that field, maybe in advertisement area or photography. So that makes me proud and that makes me like be rewarded uh, because I have a small portion uh, to develop their life. Talking about, uh, I, I disagree with the, those two terms, uh, disengaged backbenchers, uh, because <laughs> I am not, I don't think I'm the right person to say, but yes, this is true. I was also a backbencher, but I was not a disengaged backbencher. <laughs> uh, there are two kinds of backbenchers, basically. Uh, the one who are very notorious and the one <laughs> uh, you, I would, I, I think so you would agree to me. Uh, there are people who are very intelligent, but they are backbenchers because um, for them, this regular process of studying in the classroom is not uh, to be done because they, 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 they can uh, take the grasp of things more easily. They, can, uh, they are far more intelligent, basically. So uh, disengaged backbencher, uh, these two terms are contradictory for me, basically. Yes, disengaged students can be there, may not be backbenchers. But uh, what I feel, uh, because yesterday only, uh, day before yesterday and yesterday I was uh, attending Sahode. Uh, well, so there I, I, I really, uh, we, we were all talking about these kind of things. So what I feel nowadays CBSC has a lot of, I don't know about other branches, but yes, CBSC has taken a lot of initiative. If I talk about uh, five to six years back, yes, schooling was uh, kind of, uh, thing that is going on and on only studies and studies and studies and uh, what about the extracurricular activities somewhere uh, there is a yearly annual function and there is a annual sports meet these kind of things were there but within this five to six or other ten years there had been a drastic change in the pattern of schooling and teaching so students have been engaged more in critical thinking more in problem solving more in the ways of working, tools for uh, like uh, Atal uh, uh, labs are there where students attend and um, do a lot of a lot of creative thing. Uh, we like we are spellbound sometimes when they show us the thing that they have created and beautifully it is initiated. So uh, talking about disengagement now, uh, it is not 
so much uh, like happening basically because uh, the parents, the students, the teachers, the board all have found out maybe there was a lot of research work because of this. And that's why there are a lot, lot of things have come into the process where the students who uh, who are the backbenchers? I think so. Then uh, in this particular um, show, you people want uh, to say the backbenchers are the students who are not very uh, tuned with the academic part, basically. They want to fly away from the studies. Uh, but uh, there are many ways to engage those students. A student getting 40 marks, but excelling in the future, I would agree that the student is far more intelligent than a student getting 90 percentile and having a regular course of life. <laughs> I, 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 I analyze in this way, basically. Okay. Uh, th there are many uh, things which ex the, uh, the testing of their capacity in a multifaceted world as active and responsible citizen. Uh, when I was teaching in one of the reputed school of uh, Raipur, uh, one of the students who was not at all a good, uh, good in academics, I asked, I used to ask my senior student, what do you want to be in the future? What are your dreams? Uh, surprisingly, one child said that I want to be a leader. A leader means I want to move ahead with the, my country. I want to do something for my country as a leader. That surprised me a lot. Usually students say, I want to be a doctor or an engineer or I want, want to be an entrepreneur, whatever it says. I want to land in London or America, whatever. He said, no, I want to serve my country. That student was not a 90 percentile. And today he's really serving. So this is how I feel. Disengagement, if you channelize them in a proper way, if you find out their uh, roots, what they really want, actually in their life, what do they love to do? There are many ways, there are club activities, there are exhibitions, there are uh, debate competitions, there are very good speakers. They are not good students academically. In pen paper, they are not good, but they are very good speakers. So if you listen to their debates, fantastic. Uh, a 99 percentile will not be able to uh, debate, isn't it? They, he doesn't have that kind of caliber. So we need to recognize their talents, basically. We need to recognize what they really want and should not pressurize that you need to excel in your academics to this level. That will, uh, I would say, kill their, uh, all their dreams, basically. Kill all their dreams. But today, as I said, CBSC has really taken a lot of initiative. They are thinking about counseling the students. They are thinking about career counseling where there is a broad way to uh, different careers. At, during our time, they were very, very selected careers, isn't it? Nowadays, uh, students choose different careers at like, huh, obviously the parents are also like me as a parent, our generation as a parent has given, open them, open a lot of things in front of them. So backbenchers, disengagement, disengagement tab hota hai, then when we don't realize what they want in their life. Otherwise, there is ample, there are ample uh, like uh, situations and there are ample examples where we can engage them according to their choice. So this disengagement uh, word with backbenchers, first of all, I disagree, first of all. Uh, secondly, as ma'am was saying that, yes, teachers have a very big role, but at the same time, I would say there are three steps actually. Uh, first of all, we need to recognize their uh, talents. Secondly, uh, we need to give them opportunity. And the third thing is very important. We need to monitor them. And this monitoring the students is not the only uh, work of the student, uh, teachers. It's also the work of the parents. Because sometimes you would agree that the environment that he or she gets in the school with the friends, with the teachers, uh, with many things around him may not be the same at home. At home, he might be a person who is always ignored, a person who is compared with his brothers and sisters. Okay, so these things should also be monitored at the same time. So child gets disengaged when he is not uh, looked over. He is looked over, he is okay, no problem. We need to understand them. We need to understand what is his choice. We need to make them understand that we are not categorizing you according to your academics only. 
And that's the worst thing I should, that is, that should be the last thing actually. Okay. So if we don't, if we make them understand that, okay, fine, you are good at this, excel in this. Academics to the point, whatever is required, whatsoever is required, the percentage and all, it doesn't matter. You just move on with your academics, but at the same time, the career is open to you. You can take your career to your own choice and have a very, very comfortable life. So disengagement can be ruled out at any cost if we really recognize the students, those who feel that they are disengaged. And disengaged, very important. We need to, uh, another thing I have seen, they are disengaged when they don't have friends around. It's very important. In any, we are all social beings, isn't it? We cannot live alone. Students, uh, there are many students because I move with the primary, I go along with the secondary and higher secondary, all three stages of the students. The most important thing what I feel that I don't have a friend. I don't have a friend to talk, okay? Maybe the student have a very good, uh, like uh, he or she is a very good student, but somewhere there is a big, big space in her or his life. So all these things should be taken care of. It's not only academics. It's on not only a blame game. It is the student or the child who should be recognized, nurtured properly, guided properly, and show him or her the path which he or she wants to follow. So disengagement, backbenchers, no. Backbenchers can be anyone, a brilliant student. I had my uh, friends, uh, I can name her Sonadipa Ganguly. Uh, she, uh, when we had a library period, she used to uh, bring a book issue uh, like the book and she used to read five more books sitting in the back benches. And uh, the moment the teacher used to ask the question, her hand was raised for, for like the first one to raise her hand is Sonadipa. So she knows what she has to answer. She is very smart. And at the same time, she has completed five story books sitting in the back bench. <laughs> so disengage can be in the front bench, in the middle row, in the corner, anywhere. But yes, disengagement should not happen. It can be ruled out easily by understanding, by recognizing, or by like talking to them, very important, to talking to them what exactly they want to say, what do they want, the, what, do, what do they feel, uh, talk about their parents, talk about the brothers and sisters, talk about the friends, talk about the school where they come from. You will understand the child very easily. So they will never be disengaged. There are so many activities in the school happening. A good, any good school has so many activities. It's like starting from different types of competition. Every week there is a competition. There are assemblies. There are uh, uh, functions. There are exhibitions. There are presentations. We, we have so many things in our school. I, I don't feel that uh, the, um, the school where I'm teaching now or where I'm the headmistress, there are any disengaged students. Uh, luckily, I would say, I, I'm proud to say that, that there are no disengaged students because somewhere uh, the management, the teachers, uh, the faculties, we all have uh, taken a pledge that no, every student has something good, something is there, some caliber is there, we need to recognize, bring it out and make it nice. So this is what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I think that was absolutely motivational, uh, the take on the engagement of students. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mitra, sir, welcome back. I think we lost you for a bit there. Uh, must yes, be a technical issue. Uh, sir, you have the rare distinction of working with both an eminent school, which clearly has a certain social economic spectrum, and then the other end, outside the school where you teach underprivileged children. Uh, now, a lot of these underprivileged children, I'm sure, are first generation learners at home. They don't really have that uh, aura of learning. The parents are not very keen on the education of their children. Is engagement a problem with these children or are they more motivated? First of all, uh, thank you, Subhai. I want to uh, thank a notebook for giving me this golden opportunity to express my views on this uh, wonderful platform. Uh, actually, uh, if you want to know about my views, in my previous school,
did we lose connectivity with uh, Mr. Mitra? Could somebody confirm or is it just my connection? Yes, yes. No, he's back. Now it is clearly audible? Yes, sir. Much better now. If you could just please start again. Sorry, we missed it. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So actually, uh, both the words backbenchers and the adjective uh, disengaged. So, so both the negative mindset, I almost listened to all my uh, previous panelists like uh, Budet sir, Achin sir, Malavika ma'am, Rita ma'am, so how well they explained. Actually, uh, backbenchers always not negative. Our honorable late president, uh, Dr. APG Abdul Kalam, he was also a backbencher. Okay, but he came out as a flying color. So actually, uh, we should first remove the uh, the negative mindset. Huh, yes, the word disengaged, it's very much significant. Disengaged, why a child will be disengaged? Sometimes, uh, to some uh, extent, I am agree, very much agree to Rita, ma'am. Actually, uh, disengaged, sometimes we should blame ourselves also with the teachers, with the educators, with the guides, with the principals, also to some extent responsible for it. We don't try to move to the backbenchers, okay? So uh, sometimes we give or we do more focus on the uh, good children, uh, those who are academically good, okay? And those who are sitting on the backside, we uh, just give less focus on them. Actually, all the child, everybody is having the qualities, everybody is having the um, uh, capabilities, and we know that the children are very much enthusiastic. So maybe it happens that we are unable to fulfill their enthu. That happens. And uh, moreover, I want to mention three C's, communication, connection, and cooperation that a teacher should do. Maybe uh, we make a gap in between those students and the teachers. Teachers should understand it. Sometimes teachers should uh, bridge this gap. Uh, just like as you asked me uh, in my previous school, uh, I noticed it when COVID-19 lockdown started. So it was really very difficult because the complete physical classroom into virtual classroom. It was more, more difficult to convince the guardians they are not understanding. It was really challenging for the uh, principals, for the teachers, for the management to convince the guardian uh, that uh, you have to, means engaging, means if we don't engage the children, if you ask me, sir, uh, whether you agree with online classroom or whether online classroom is the real substitute of physical classroom. I honestly speak, I'm honestly speaking at the very initial stage, I had to tell the guardian that online class can never be the substitute of physical classroom. But now at present, standing in 21st century, we can't say and definitely online class can be the greatest substitute for physical classroom because it is the best way to engage the children. Unless until we engage the children, they will create some unproductive thoughts, unproductive works. So that we should understand. And gradually we became success. Gradually uh, means I became successful. I uh, tried to make the guardian aware that uh, yes, something is better than nothing. You first, it is maybe it is not possible to give 100% in online class uh, due to some connectivity problem, uh, some uh, means face-to-face -face work or many things are there. But still, if you assign some works, assign some activities, uh, students are meeting the teachers, uh, they are interacting. So in this way, they will be engaged until unless they are engaged, what they will do? They will pass their time. Sometimes we find what Rita ma'am said, I appreciate her that in her school, no child is disengaged. Yes, I am also trying my level best to do it, but my school is an interior area and uh, the children, they are more prone to uh, social medias. Okay, it's okay. But still uh, the teachers, the principals, the educators, uh, they should take the uh, leading responsibility to uh, make them aware, to counsel them, uh, 
uh, what is good, what is bad, because we can't detach the 21st century children from digital world. They will have the smartphone, they will have the tabs, they will uh, means engage themselves in digital world, but they should understand what we are doing or what we should not do. So that thing I want to say that uh, we should use the energy of the children. Means sometimes we find that uh, children after attending the class, after attending six or six, seven periods, uh, they are uh, means doing chaos, means crap. I think we are facing a bit of uh, connectivity issues at Sir's end. Yes, uh, yes, Suhayu, do you want to say something? No, 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 sir. We had a bit of a connection issue. I think it's better now. Yes, yes, yes. Some connecting. Actually, I am in Siliguri now. That's why maybe I'm some here. The uh, means today's weather is also not suitable. That's why maybe this thing is happening. So I will not uh, extend my speech. The thing that I want to say means we have to find out some ways. We have to make some strategies. We have to create some plan that how to engage the children. As Rita Ma'am said, where the students are sitting, that is not important. Maybe he is sitting in the back bench, maybe he's sitting in the front bench, maybe he's sitting in the middle bench. That is not important. How much the child is engaged, that a teacher should uh, keep his or her strong vigil. And uh, it is not that it may happen. Na? The children is not accepting you or in which method, in which technique you are teaching, maybe he is not getting the interest. There may be two reasons. Either he is uh, not liking you, not preferring you, not finding interest in you, or uh, maybe uh, he is or she is having some other reasons. Other reason means uh, some psychological orders, disorders, or maybe some mental stress, maybe some family issues, or maybe some other things. So unless, until we go to him or her, until unless we make some communication, interaction, connection, cooperation, how will you understand? So that thing uh, a teacher should feel. Uh, means every day, just like uh, I say to my teacher that nowadays teaching profession is going to be the most challenging profession. Teaching means you will go and just you will give some uh, knowledge to the students from the book. It is not enough. Now, according to NEP, National Education Policy, means skill-based education, research-oriented education, um, uh, art-integrated education, uh, experiential learning, project-based learning, uh, how you can engage the children, not only in academics, Maybe a child should have the other qualities also. Maybe he's a good singer, he's a good a spokesperson, maybe he's a good dancer, uh, good orator, good artist, good painter, whatever he or she is. You should feel it as a teacher, you should understand it. What qualities are there in the student? And as per that one, you, are, you should go. Means uh, the student is going to some other direction and you are going to some other direction. So that can never be merged. At first, you should find the interest of the student. And according to that, you should go. Because nowadays, it is student-centric class, not teacher-centric class. Students should be learned on their own pace. So what I want to say in a nutshell, that how to engage the child in a class, it's up to the teacher. It's up to the situation, in which situation you are teaching. If the students are not understanding, or if the students are making chaos, if the students are not getting result, if the students are not enriched in their skill, in their capabilities, what is the result of your teaching? So you first do the analysis of it. You should have first, being a teacher, you should have first uh, apply your critical thinking. Then you can uh, get it. Maybe I am extending a much. I just I want to close here. Uh, I want to say one thing for all. And uh, being a principal, I am also feeling. I am also trying it. That how to engage the child in which activity, uh, or how you can use the energy of the child, use the energy of the child, and make the rotation. Why a term will be used back bencher? Make the student sit in the middle bench also, in the front bench also. Give him uh, some opportunity. Okay, maybe he is frightened of you, or he is not liking you. 
or one he starts appreciating you liking you and worshiping you adoring you gradually that uh, term disengaged back ventures everything will be abolished i want to uh, conclude my speech uh, with the uh, line of injamamul haq one veteran uh, retired pakistani cricketer so when he retired from the international cricket in a press conference he was asked how you are feeling so he answered in a single sentence that if one loves something if one respects something if one adores something it is very hard to leave it so if the child understand that is it is the teacher is teaching for me i am understanding and if if the child appreciates praises adores respects loves the teacher or his or her teaching to so gradually the term disengaged or back benchers everything will be removed because it is said that love and respect is to be obtained only by giving love and respect in return so we can't never blame the child a disengaged one we should sometimes apply the term to the teachers or to uh, to the principals also and to all the stakeholders as rita ma'am also said to the parents also parents should also play a crucial role uh, to nurture the child so this much for today uh, i want to uh, say this much only thank you can i can i just uh, yes sir yeah i want to add something uh, which is let's do away with the term back benchers now to do that what the teacher can always do is rehash or rearrange the furniture in the classroom in an offline mode and you know you you can rearrange your furniture so you don't have any back benches you make it circular you make it semi circular you put yourself in the center like you have in an amphitheater there are so many ways one can do that if a teacher is thinking and but but you know chubrato i also want to say that we also have to protect the interest of our teachers the online classes has really shown that our teachers were able to really take it on and do it so well even the ones who were not so happy with technology and they have today made a success of the online classes yes plenty less to go yes we can do more but they have done it so and in the online classes instead of you know taking the children by roll number if the teacher can once in a while chat to the children leave the chat box open challenge yourself that let me allow the children to leave the chat box open let me see what they are chatting about let me see how i can bring around the correction there that might also help to remove the term back benches so that's about all shubhayu thank you so much ma'am and uh, mr mitra thank you so much i think that was a wonderful take on the whole concept of disengagement or back benches uh, well with that uh, we have also come to the end of the session uh, pretty much out of time i'll quickly uh, take this opportunity to thank our speakers but it's a thank you so much for the wonderful start uh, those examples that you gave of people who were typically not academically very high scoring uh, turned out to be bright minds in their own uh, chosen fields i think that's a great way to actually say that engagement need not be engagement with x y and z subjects but engagement needs to be engagement of the individual with their chosen area of interest thank you so much sir Uh, Rita, ma'am, I I love the way you initially said that there are not disengaged students, only disengaged teachers or disengaged parents. Uh, blows our topic to hell, but uh, I think that's a very very interesting take to have that the student fundamentally sitting there is actually clay that's looking to be molded, and if the ecosystem, the stakeholders, they stay positive towards it, then engagement is an obvious result. Thank you so much, ma'am, for being here. Um, Malubika, ma'am, thank you so much for disjoining the terms. a uh, back benches and disengage uh yes very very true uh, back benches did have a lot of fun but we also saw <laughs> brilliance oh, in the back benches and bring my pen back bring my pen here i know i will be better and and uh, i love the fact that you put the two separately and i think both you in fact all of you all four of you have stressed on the point that a personal connection between the teacher and the student is the key ingredient to all engagement thank you so much ma'am for being here today Mr Mitro I loved how you brought out also that same value of personal connection the human connection between the teacher and the student which is so so critical to developing engagement in the classroom 
At the end of the day, we have to kind of remember, it's not a teacher and a student as two concepts that who engage with each other. It is actually two human beings, two individuals, and a human connection is but natural. Thank you, thank you for all of that. Uh, to all the wonderful members in the audience, thank you so much. I know we were on a bit of a break, as you might have seen from the Q&A. Uh, we were privileged to have been working with uh, the Savadaya team who are hosting uh, the Savadaya conference that happened over the last two days. Uh, the, the love and support that you've shown to this particular platform was one of the reasons why, why we felt uh, confident enough that we could perhaps uh, help in an event of that magnitude. And we understand from the comments that some people might have liked what uh, we managed to put together. Thank you for all your love and support. We hope to see you again in our next session. Until then, please take care, stay safe, and goodbye. Thank you. Shibai you. Shibai you. Yes, ma'am. Shibai you. Somebody has to thank you and thank Notebook for this wonderful effort. So uh, on behalf of everybody there and the panelists, I thank you very, very much. I thank Gagori for contacting me. And I thank Notebook. I have heard about Notebook. I quite enjoyed the videos and shall meet up. However, I leave with a request. Have a panel on how we can better protect our teachers. Our teachers need a lot of protection. With that, I conclude. Thanks. Wonderful, ma'am. I think that's a great uh, suggestion. Uh, Kaguri, please make a note of it. Sure. Um, very soon, let's have a panel on how we can better protect our teachers. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, stay protected. Stay safe. <laughs> take care. I will bid you good night. And this is where we end. Thank you.